You've just entered the Disaster Tough podcast, the place for emergency managers, first responders, and humanitarians who want to get the job done. Stories, lessons, and tips are provided by field experts. I'm your host, John Scardina, owner of Doberman Emergency Management and former federal emergency response official who's responded to some of the most extreme disasters. Disaster Tough is our mantra. It combines experience, training, and analytics in order to be successful at any stage within the disaster life cycle. It means being a professional in emergency and disaster services. Doberman Emergency Management lives by this. If your organization needs to fill a gap, please contact us. We can help. Contact info is in the show notes. We also support other products and organizations that will increase your ability. For example, if you fight wildfires, hurricanes, a pandemic, any disaster in the field, at a hospital or command center, listen up. You're missing out if you do not use L3 Harris for your radio comms. They are secure, portable, mobile, and scalable, which is great news for us in the field. A truly disaster tough radio system. Check out the XL family of radios by clicking on the show notes or simply go to L3Harris.com. When you think of situational awareness, you need to think of Futurity IT. They are disaster tough because they saw a gap and figure out how to close it by creating the Orion and Athena applications. Situational awareness is all about speed, coordination, and accuracy of information. Futurity IT's Orion app collects and provides preliminary damage assessments and integrates all incident action plan documents with WebEOC. The Athena app allows for planning, contact tracing, and customizable group coordination in every single phase of the disaster lifecycle. The best part? Futurity IT made both applications extremely intuitive. It's so easy to use. Click on the show notes today to schedule a free demo. Welcome back to the show, everybody. It's your host, John Scardina. I am so excited for this episode. You know, it's a, you know, we get to uh, we have the opportunity to interview people who have just been trailblazers in their career and have really helped out emergency management. And today is no exception. We get to interview Pete Gaynor, who is the acting. Uh, he, in fact, he was the designated as the acting secretary of Homeland Security, and he was obviously the FEMA administrator. He was with Rhode Island for a number of years. He was a Marine for 25 years. So a huge shout out to all those different accolades. Pete, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. It's great to be here. So, acting director of the Department of Homeland Security, that's a, was that a shock to you or was that like, okay, like, you know, how does that process even happen going from FEMA to, to DHS? Yeah, so I think I just followed the, uh, the, the, what 2020 was all about. Like every day was a new adventure, a new challenge. And mm. uh, into 21, uh, uh, Unexpected, but you know uh, it's a dynamic world out there. So, uh, and we are emergency managers, so we adapt to ch ever-changing situations. And and that was just another one uh, icing on the cake. And uh, I was honored to be the acting secretary, even if it was for a short period of time. Uh, it was an honor to lead the men and women of DHS. Yeah, it, it's amazing um, talking to my friends who are still at FEMA. I was obviously at FEMA, and uh, you're wildly popular. And if you talk to them, it it sounds like you were with FEMA for, you know, 40 years, you know, you're acting, I mean, you're the deputy before, but then I mean, you're only acting administrator for about, about a year. Right. And so maybe you can just describe to our listeners for those emergency managers out there, or those people trying to get into the field of like, Hey, how do you walk into a room and, and create command presence? How do you think you were able to do that so quickly? Uh, well, I mean, so I, I, I've been in the emergency management business for probably 13 years now. And, and so at the local level, I started in a, at the city of Providence. Uh, I was there for seven years, went to the state for four years, and obviously to the federal government and, and my military background being in the Marine Corps for uh, almost 26 years. Uh, so, you know, all that combined uh, and all the, the, uh, the forging along the way, right? So uh, little disasters, big disasters, uh, one of my uh, previous employers, the mayor of Providence, asked me to be the chief operating officer uh, for almost a year for the, uh, the Providence school system, right? So that's not really a emergency manager thing. But I think all those things um, give you experience, give you uh, a perspective. And, um, you know, obviously scale is a lot bigger at the federal level than it is at the state or the local level. And, and you just scale it up. But, you know, 
from, from my point of view, I didn't change at all, right? I, I think uh, from the, uh, you know, from my early days uh, to my last days at FEMA, I, I, I like to think I was the same kind of leader throughout the entire, uh, you know, my entire uh, emergency management career. You didn't let it get to your head, essentially. That's what you're trying to say. Oh, no, 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 you can't. Yeah. You, uh, it's, uh, first of all, it, it is, is uh, if, if, if you have to think about that, like ego and, uh, you know, what other people are thinking, what the media is saying, right, all that, you, you will fail, right? You have to kind of tune all that out and, uh, and just do the right thing, right? And sometimes the right thing can be uh, easy and sometimes the right thing can be painful. But if you just kind of stick to those uh, principles, uh, you, you will be successful, right? Don't, don't, you can't listen to all the chatter. Uh, you, you can't listen to how much people like you or how much people hate you or, or what the media is saying pro con. You just have to, and especially, you know, this past 2020, you, you have to gut your way through it. Yeah, I mean, talk about it a year to uh, a year in review to to talk about that specific topic, because I feel like ego was and is right. It, it's such a huge problem. Uh, you know, social media, right? Social media has amazing capability to reach people, and for that reason, we're it's great. But it's horrible, horrible, horrible for uh, boosting up ego and narcissism. And it, as a guy who wrote his you know, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, wrote my undergrad in emergency management about how narcissism will cause more man-made incidents. You know, this, this actually brings up a, a topic that's like really close to, to what I have to deal with is how do you address narcissism and ego, whether it's by position or title, uh, and, how, and how does that apply to mitigating threat? And so I think about that a lot of like, the mitigation process of why we don't talk about the psychological impact of daily living and how that applies to emergency management. Do you ever think about that? Yeah, you know, so uh, first of all, if you've, uh, if you've ever been uh, and worked and lived in Washington, D.C., uh, there's plenty of ego to go around for everybody, <laughs> right? So yeah. uh, to add uh, your ego, and, you know, and everyone has one, it's really about how you, how you uh, control right. it. Mm -hmm. And and, and my, in my from my point of view, and you can ask you know my, you know my my former coworkers, uh, I'm all about the deeds, right? So uh, uh, the the president asked me to to take on a mission, uh, and I'm going to do it. And uh, if you if you never hear from me again, right, I'm fine with that. Uh, and it's all about accomplishing the mission because that's I mean that is the core of what emergency managers are solving uh, hard problems. Uh, because there is no one else to solve, them, right? And so, uh, and, and I think that's why I, I like this business. Like, give me your hard problem, give me your hardest problem, uh, I will solve it. And uh, it's just not me. You know, uh, FEMA is twenty thousand strong, uh, amazing uh, men and women career officials uh, that perform amazing work uh, that allow the agency to be successful. So, uh, yeah, you, you got to set ego aside. There's plenty of that down there. Um, uh, and, and if you, if you think you're more important than the mission, uh, again, I think this is, will lead to your failure, uh, and maybe even lead to your firing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I, I've actually seen that in real time, you know, people argue for things that they, they argue against things that they actually agree with because it's attacking their ego. Yeah. And you, you, you get them to go to dinner with you and you say, Hey, you actually agree with this, right? And they're like, yeah, I'm like, why were you fighting against this? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And, and it takes uh, that, it takes that moment to kind of breathe, um, you know, with people, but yeah. you didn't really have time to breathe in 2020, as far as I know, and, and you can correct me, I'm, I'm sure you, yep. you, you know, feel free, 300 disasters, $57 billion alone, I think for, uh, for the pandemic, the pandemic first response, pandemic response controlled by FEMA. I mean, talk about not having time to like get in the way. And yeah. there was a lot of outside sources trying to get in the way, right? Yeah. And so I, I, we're not po political on the show, but I'm just saying there's talk about, you know, go mode, right? No, you know, so, um, yeah, so uh, again, 2020 historic in every way, and it, and it continues. And, you know, we are closer to the end of the pandemic than we, than, uh, we are to the beginning. And that's a great thing. Uh, you know, hopefully in a year, uh, it's, it's a, you know, a, chapter in a book. We, and hopefully we learn a lot of lessons from it so we can improve uh, the way we deal with these kind of things. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the, uh, the administration 
uh, when I was there, gave me uh, a mission and they gave me uh, uh, freedom to operate um, and really clear direction about what, what needed to happen. And I think, mm. in, and again, you know, um, I, I try not to listen to the media because it'll make you crazy, right? You, you, <laughs> you'll, you'll be consumed by that. So I, so yeah. I try not to listen to any of that uh, and, and just really try to accomplish what, the, the, what needed to be accomplished and try to get the entire government, uh, you know, 40 plus agencies all on the same sheet of music and many agencies that never operated together before, right? Uh, so if right. You, had, you had said that, you know, why do I have to be partners with the FDA? Why, why does an emergency manager, you know, pre-COVID, have to know the FDA or it's, you know, it's state or local equivalent? Uh, and you would say, well, probably not, but it, it's, it was critical, right, that we made these partnerships. Uh, and I think, I think the good thing about uh, 2020 was, at least from my perspective at the federal level, right, uh, that everyone on the team, the COVID team, uh, in the administration, understood where what we needed to do and where we needed to go. Now we didn't agree all the time about you know the 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 the, uh, the tactics of it and this free dialogue back and forth. But at the end of the day, right, at the end of the day, the president's in charge. Uh, the vice president chairs the the COVID task force every day, right. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh it's from my point of view, uh, I, I was empowered to do all the things I needed to do. Uh, we spent we spent a lot of money, right, and 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 probably still spending more, more money today. Um, but it's a uh, again historic and unprecedented time in uh, American history, and, and really, it's like as the, the core of it is right. All decisions that you make are about saving lives. It's all about mm -hmm. that, right? Uh, when you think about you know, uh, pandemics, you know, versus like a hurricane and what FEMA's role is. Typically, FEMA is in after the hurricane, all the destruction. Uh, all the death and injuries have happened, right? So we're not really preventing that uh, in a hurricane. In a pandemic, it's totally different. We're trying to prevent, you know, deaths and suffering by taking actions. And it's really you had to change your mindset uh, as an emergency manager about like you know how how aggressive you need to be to do that, right? So again, uh, great partners, um, great employees, part of the team uh, that let us uh, that let us be successful. You bring up a really interesting point that uh, your two predecessor, predecessors were both on the show, Brock Long and Craig Fugate, and they have different perspectives, and I'm sure you'll have a different perspective. Yeah. And um, here, here's the scenario, right? Uh, I was on the national IMAT, and my entire job was response. My entire job was trying to stop it from getting worse by supporting the state in their response missions, and I took a lot of pride in that. There is a thought process, and, and now we're, the agency is being led. Uh, congratulations, um, Administrator Chriswell, for that. Yeah, she's great. Um, by a formal IMAT, which I'm like, yes, right? But, like, there's this thought process of emergency managers, uh, essentially what you said, right? Most of the time they go in either pre- or post-event, and they start manhandling the situation. Uh, I don't know if I can say that word anymore, but that's a term, right? Uh, and... Then you have this other group, and I'm kind of in the other group that says, wait, uh, emergency managers have a role in response, and we need that role in response. And so looking back over 2020 and, and headquarters, let's be real, headquarters has some of the best and some a lot of the armchair people, right? I fortunately got to work with a lot of the best. And, you know, by, by switching over that train of thought to, okay, now we're doing, we're doing preventative in response right? Do you think there's a role for that? And if you do think there's a role for that, what are some of the after actions that you would take from saying, okay, if your emergency manager is in response, what do you do? Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, I think, uh, again, this is my, my personal belief that uh, uh, the pandemic will change the way uh, the nation or a governor or a mayor or a tribal chief uses emergency managers, right? So, 100%. I think, you know, pre-COVID, it's all about, you know, uh, the, the small part of prevention, what we do. We, we don't do enough prevention in this country. Uh, we don't Correct. spend enough money on that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, post-disaster going in there and, you know, and, and trying to make it better. Uh, I think uh, after, after uh, COVID, after rations done, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how this plays out in Congress, uh, that FEMA should have a greater role in managing, um, uh, you know, challenges to the nation when it comes to you know uh, the civil part of it, uh, 
and it needs to be uh, ahead of time, not reactive. And so what I think typically happens right across the, across the country is when it all starts to unravel, right? And you're not really sure what to do if you're a leader, you, you, you look around and you say, who do I call? Well, I'm gonna call the emergency manager. If it's not in the emergency management realm, right? To, to have them un unravel it and help you uh, contain it. I think that's probably too late, right? So we need, I think if we're smart, we learn uh, hard lessons uh, from COVID. Uh, FEMA needs to have a more prominent role uh, in managing the, the, the internal national challenges to the country. So you know, is that a is that a another pandemic or is it a, a you know a, a national power outage or is it something else? And when you think about it, right, um, you know FEMA has the Stafford Act, and you know as administrator, I was responsible for natural disasters, and and that's all great when you have natural disasters that fit that fit that model, right? That are not not so big um, and not so small where you know you don't need FEMA, but they fit that model. And then you have the pandemic where HHS is statutorily responsible for uh, public health emergency, right? And that's a whole different apparatus. It's a whole different apparatus, not to say that FEMA would not support that, but it, now you have two different apparatuses. And, and you could probably go through government and find multiple apparatuses uh, that require uh, uh, intergovernmental coordination at every level. And it's only one agency that does that, and that's FEMA. And we're, and we're built for that. So we, I, I, I would you know, uh, be a proponent of... Uh, giving, and, and so this is, you know, needs more resources, uh, it probably needs some law and some authority, but you need to give FEMA a bigger role in managing these national responses from the beginning, right? That way you don't fall behind and, and try to play catch up. And, and we did a little bit of that in COVID-19, but again, let's learn some great lessons uh, from, from uh, 2020, 2021, and let's make this profession and let's make this uh, way that emergency managers work uh, today uh, better, right? And I think we should have a more prominent role uh, in, in that, a, a deliberate role, not an after uh kind of role where we think, oh, we should have done this or, or reactive. Like it's, it, this is the way we, this is the way we're going to operate uh, in these big, big uh, challenges to the, the nation. Okay. You have said so many points that I agree with, and I want to touch on those points because I want to dive into them a little bit more. So one really big problem with emergency management is that, okay, I run a company called Doberman Emergency Management. So it's picking on myself as well, but emergency management is a misnomer, right? Like emergency, it's really emergency coordination. And uh, I, I keep on seeing like these, uh, these fringe video, I call them fringe, these videos and uh, these, these stories, right, from media saying like, oh, here's the secret group that really impacted, uh, you know, the COVID response. Here's some, a team of doctors here in the federal agency, and here's um, public health in here. And it's like, okay, first of all, that's BS. But, like, you go through all these different groups, like, everybody secretly has been managing, like, they're so secret here. Like, if, if you're all compartmentalized, then you are not effective. The only group in the federal government that should be doing it and is built to do it, is designed to do it, is trained to do it, is the federal emergency management agency, right? Like, that yeah. just makes sense. Yeah, so, it, it is. And, you know, first of all, we're, we're the only agency that has emergency in our name. So that's, that's a, you know, <laughs> a, a, up or a, a plus or a minus, I'm not sure. Uh, but, you know, and, and I think, and I, I just think back to conversations with my, my counterparts and you know, the 40 other departments and agencies at the federal level, you know, if they were honest with each other, even if they, even if they owned a primary role in, in response, uh, they realized early on that, that they, they didn't have the bandwidth, right? They weren't built for the thing that the nation needed them to do, right? And FEMA was the, was the mechanism that allowed them to, to, to be better, right? And, and again, that is our role, and we should we should maximize that. And I know there's some there's, I'm I'm sure right now there's some FEMA uh, leaders shaking their heads about no we don't want any more right we don't want any more <laughs> we, we have enough at FEMA. But if we, but if we're honest with ourselves uh, and, and and our job is to manage these uh, these uh, you know historic disasters or threats to the nation, I'm not sure who else can do it at that level. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question, then I'm going to give my opinion. I usually give my opinion first because I'm that guy, but I'm going to ask your opinion then because you're saying that they, FEMA needs to be bigger. I agree. Uh, okay, everyone keeps on telling me the ship has sailed. Screw that. 
FEMA in or out of DHS? The guy who served in both yeah. roles now, in or out? Yeah, I don't care. So here, here's the deal, <laughs> right? So, That's um, a good answer. So, right. Uh, I, in, in, my, in my career, I worked uh, directly for a mayor, right? Uh, like my, uh, I'll start on the line to the mayor. He was my boss. And it was great having access to the mayor, right? Uh, and, but, you know, what reality of it is, uh, and, and so pretty much all the people that I've worked for as a, as a, you know, emergency manager, director said, I never want to see you in my office, right? Don't come and see me because it's all bad news. Uh, but, you know, a mayor or a governor, direct line, they don't have time for, they can't care and feed for you because you're one of 50 departments, right? And it's yeah. nice to say, I work for the governor, I work for the mayor, right? It's nice to say that, or I work for the president, right? It's really nice to say that. But in, in practical terms, uh, I, I, it, it doesn't really help me or hurt me. Uh, well, and I worked for uh, a public safety commissioner who was, uh, you know, between um, me and the mayor uh, or me and the governor, right? And, and, that's, and that's fine, right? And it's all about, you know, if the, if the leader, the governor, the president understands what your role is in an emergency and, and gives you access, then who, who cares who you work for? So in, in, so in, uh, in DHS, so FEMA is a component under DHS. I work for a couple of different secretaries. The last one, Secretary Wolf, and he was my, he was my direct boss. But I also work for the vice president at the, on the task force. And, and that, you know, the, the, the secretary didn't get in my way about any of that. Well, we didn't need to screen what I was saying to the president or the vice president. It's just a relationship that we had. And I think that's the kind of relationship that anyone needs to have. So does FEMA need to be in, in you know, direct line to the, the president? I, I don't know. I'm not sure that it matters. It's, it's great to say it, but, mm. you know, who's, who's going to advocate for you? I had the secretary, right, of Homeland Security that was, was my, my advocate, uh, you know, to the president or to the cabinet. And, that's you know, awesome. there's pros and cons. So, again, it's, it's about the relationships that you build. Uh, first of all, I think that's hilarious. You're like, oh, I just don't care. Just get the job done. That's what you're saying, right? Get the job done. Yeah. There is I a mean, um, draw all right the up. line diagrams you want. I don't really. <laughs> and so here's the deal, right? So there's a you know the, the pan cap plan was the plan that everyone was going to subscribe to for a pandemic, right? On the books, right. that whole that whole org chart, never and never. I mean, it's a great it's a great chart and an exercise, right? And it looks good and, and it makes sense on paper. But guess what? We didn't use it. It didn't work, right? It, it, that that diagram didn't work. It worked because the, the situation was different, and we adapted to it. So I don't know. I, I'm, I know I try not to get too worked up about like the line diagram and who has access and who doesn't have access. If I needed so, to go see the president, I could go do it. Do you care about Do you care about ICS? Then are you a fan of ICS? It sounds like you don't really care for it. Uh, yeah. So listen. Um, it, it Sorry, I'm just like, curious, you, really, at, at this no, point. No, no, no. Yeah. So this is so it's it's building blocks, and I and, and so I grew up on ICS and NIMS, and it's all important to what we do. Yeah. Um. And and, and you know we're all you know FEMA has EMI, and, and we train a bunch of people. We train a bunch of people right mm. across the country. So from emergency managers to uh, firefighters to you know you you name it, police officers, right? Uh, I'm a, I was amazed. They showed me the numbers when I was at, at FEMA about how many police officers we train a year. It's like, why are we training so many police officers? Uh, but but the but the but the that's that's training. But what we need to do more of is education, right? We need to be better educated. So um, you know, we hired hi, hi, Jeff Stern, Dr. Stern, who's now the the, the superintendent at EMI, has a has a you know background in education to try mm. to do some of those things and not just do training because training is training, right? You can train anyone, uh, but what we really need to do as a profession, and I think FEMA needs to be the leader of it, is educate people. And they're doing some of that now in some of those leadership courses, uh, but it's not enough. We need, to, we need to do more of it. And so did I get my ICS 100 certificate? Yep, I got it. But okay, <laughs> what's next? What's next? Yeah. Let's, let's educate uh, the emergency managers across the country because that's, that's a much better investment. Okay, man. So I'm, not sure about, I answered, I, I'm not sure I answered your question. You, you answered the that. question. You answered the question. Here's This is so funny because uh, you know Todd DeVoe. Uh, no. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, I think you were on his podcast, DM Weekly, uh, before, which I'm sure is a great show. Um, and I know Jeff Stern because I went to Georgetown. He was at Georgetown. 
uh, for my masters. And so like, I, I'm, I know the players that you're talking about here and um, some of the things, and the reason why I bring up Todd DeVoe is because, uh, well, let's back up a little bit. You brought up Providence. Providence, was the first municipality in the United States, right, to get EMAP certified. EMAP yep. is Emergency Management Advisory, Accreditation right? Accreditation program. Accreditation program, sorry, yeah. So um, you're a big fan. Also, you're part of IAEM. You've been an award yep. by them, so you're, you're certified emergency manager. Okay, I'm like building this whole thing up. Yep. Todd DeVoe is the person who's gotten me closest to changing my train of thought. And I, I have a ton of respect for you, and so maybe you can change my th- train of thought here. I am admittedly, and I am is going to like have a hit out on me or something, but I am admittedly not a big fan of CEM because you're right. You take your ICS 100, 200, 700, 800, 4, 3, whatever. And you're like, okay, most of that's online courses. Click, 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 click. Common sense. Done. You got it. You show that you're in it for three years. You show that you went to an exercise and now you're a certified emergency manager. You pay a bunch of money. And I'm like, why doesn't, because FEMA is set up to do this and has EMI, why doesn't FEMA move forward towards a licensing process where you have done all the accolades, the training, the education, but you also have response. And so you're creating these tiers of licenses. Why don't we do that? Yeah, yeah so it's really great. So, uh, you know, so I came just, just like, so you understand where my head is on all this. So I came mm-hmm. out of the military. Uh, right in emergency management. I, really, I, I was an infantry officer. I didn't have any emergency management background other than living in chaos in the military. It's, just, it's generally the same thing, but without without guns and bullets. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I personally, I like standards, right? And military is all about standards. And so, yes, sir. you know, from the, from the, from the basic rifleman to the general, like there's all stand, all these standards and, and it's high and it's how you get people trained and qualified to do certain things. And, and, you know, so that's, you know, standards of training is there's a professional education in, in the military also, but standards, I, I think standards are, are good because if you don't have standards, then you just wait, you just winging it. Right. And it may yeah. look good on paper, but when the pressure comes and the heat comes, you, you, you'll wilt on it. Right. So that's why I, 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 I love EMAP. Right. Uh, I, so I, I, I got uh, the city accredited and I got the state accredited. I think standards right. are important to, to establish the foundation for the profession, right? The, you know, what you do. And, and I think the CEM, you know, could it be better? Yeah, could it be more demanding? It could be, but, but it, is a, it is a start and, it, and it's relatively new. And so, and there, and there are standards in that. And so there is no other, I don't think there's any other equivalent certification out there, you know, at that yeah, that's the thing. Know, at yeah. the IEM level. So, I mean, I like to have like, to me, a, a standard. And the standard is the bare minimum from my point of view. So if you met the standard, you met the bare minimum and now make that thing better as you go. I, I think you're right on. It's one of the things I, and I wish I, I wish 2020 didn't get in the way because I, I had a lot of ideas and initiatives for EMI and what we want to do up there. I want to, uh, you know, establish the, the, the theme as a university, right? Yeah, that'd be cool. You know, be, become a accredited university and actually do some of those things and, and partner with IEM and use their about, you know, whatever the certificate for, you know, the, the leadership courses, why can't we, why can't we do that together uh, and, and do it in a more academic way, right? Uh, with higher academic standards. And then it means something, but again, it's still a standard. Uh, uh, you know, you, you want to do more than the standard, but you have to have a mm-hmm. foundation. So, yeah, I, I think we need to be much more involved at FEMA uh, in, in all those things, you produce a quality emergency manager. I'm helping me as the administrator, right? Because it's all tied together, local, state, you know, tribe, yeah. territories, it's all tied together. And, and if you don't do it, then again, it just, it's just, uh, it becomes a nice idea. I like how you said that, you know, like CM specifically, like CM is the baseline. Uh, you know, what I used to say, and, and like I said, Todd kind of got me around this, but I say like, I, I sell CEM on your, on your resume. That doesn't tell me anything, but if we're looking at it as like, okay, I would I hate to say like bare minimum, like, okay, you have your CEM. What else have you done? What else have you done to prove that? And I, I like looking at it like that. Um, you talk about chaos. I read the book, um, call sign chaos uh, about general Mattis. Yeah. And, um, 
I have taken, speaking of training and education, I am so sick of taking training and education on leadership. Like in, in my undergrad master's is all about uh, leadership, leadership, leadership. Yeah. I will say that that book on leadership is one of the best resources I've ever seen on leadership because it specifically notes like, okay, Marines are all about standards. Here's the educational materials. I mean, he notes about 50 books that he has read that he suggests other people read um, to help you, you know, become a better leader. And so I'm like, okay, like if you're, if you as the Marine, 25 years as a Marine and you had big accolades there as well, moved over into the, uh, the FEMA world, the, you know, in fact, Rhode Island world, right. Um, and, and you brought that idea of standards, then I can get behind that for sure. I still, I'm still wish that uh, CEM had tiers. That's like my big thing. If CEM starts doing tiers, I, I trust, I'll say, even if you failed miserably, I trust anybody who's gone through response, who understands what it feels like when you're, you've been through the ringer, when you're just emotionally and physically exhausted, but you're doing it for other people. So you keep going. I will, tr I will back that person up you know, like no other versus the person who's been through a training and, you know, the artificiality of a training, maybe we can get better at that, but that's just what it is. So let's kind of move on because you, you have, uh, you have these big things. Another one, big one that you did that you oversaw was Puerto, Puerto Rico infrastructure plan. Now that one's really curious to me because you mentioned earlier prevention and, uh, you know, I think of uh, mitigation, right? We, we always think of mitigation after disaster, yeah. but, hopefully we can start training ourselves to like what I say, the firefighters did a great job of putting themselves out of a job. Most of what firefighters do is respond to medical. Now they don't respond to fires. Right. And yeah. so like when you're, when you're walking through that process of, uh, you know, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico's infrastructure, what was, was it updated since like what, 1950? Yeah, it was 50 and, years old and, and not yeah. maintained, not maintained at all. I was lucky I hate to say it like this. I responded to Hurricane Harvey. I was there four days before Harvey hit, and it was the largest response of in U.S. history for uh, uh, a hurricane, a huge hurricane, Category Four. Did not make the news as much as Puerto Rico, and I believe for one of the many reasons was the infrastructure, let alone the politics. However, what do we do now with infrastructure in Puerto Rico? And why, this is a kind of a funny one, why didn't we involve Elon Musk and his big thing about making it all uh, solar, the entire, the entire island? Can you talk about that at all? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why we didn't uh, involve Elon Musk. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, the, the way, so, you know, for those that maybe are not uh, versed in emergency management and what, how, what FEMA's role is, is in the simplest of terms, we reimburse for, for, for uh, cost, right? Uh, we don't. Yeah. We don't go direct and pay Elon Musk or anyone else to do work. I mean, there, there, there may be a circumstance where we we do, but it, it's very limited. Uh, you know, it's really on, and we'll we'll keep this simple. It's on the governor of the state, or in this case, the governor of Puerto Rico, to 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 make a recovery plan, right? And we guide them, technical assistance, lots of you know uh, hand holding along the way, lots of back and forth, lots of oversight, right? Because uh, you know what kind of challenges we've had down there. Uh, and and we support the governor's plan for recovery, right? Mm. And so uh, you know the governor's down there; they, they had a plan. Uh, it, it took it took a while. I mean, the, the, you know, first of all, uh, the, the Maria was the second disaster. The first disaster was the fiscal disaster uh, down there, and, and you know it, mm. it didn't help anything in Puerto Rico. And it takes a while, at, you know, at the scale. Like you know, we're going to replace the entire power grid of Puerto Rico, size of Connecticut, right? We're gonna replace the entire power grid for the most part, uh, from, from houses to, you know, the connection on a house to, you know, the, the generator that creates the power. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's an immense undertaking. Uh, so, uh, and again, working with uh, the, the, uh, the government down there, came up with a plan uh, and approved their plan for the three biggest pots of money was for power. Uh, the second biggest was for water. And the, and the third biggest was for education. And mm -hmm. so uh, that, so the, the largest single project worksheet in FEMA history, one project, and so you're familiar with project worksheets, we're gonna do a project worksheet for a culvert, right? That's the like a $100,000 project worksheet for a culvert. Uh, mm -hmm. In Puerto Rico, one project worksheet for the power system, uh, 
$10.3 billion for one project. No. And then followed by uh, education uh, was um, uh, 2.3, followed by water, which was like 4.1, uh, right? So Not. 15, another $15 billion to do infrastructure down there. So, uh, so huh. lots, of, lots of investment, lots of hard work. Uh, actually, the, the hard work is only beginning now because uh, I tell people it's, it's easy to get the money, right? It's really hard to spend the money correctly. Mm. Uh, so they're going to have they're going to have many years ahead of them. And, and, I, and I'll tell you a conversation I had with the previous governor uh, of Puerto Rico. And, and I said to her, uh, um, listen, you have a and I, and I would say this to the governor today that you have a once in a lifetime opportunity, like no governor in the history of America, no governor in any other state has to actually remake your island into something that is is is, um, uh, you, you know, uh, improved in every way, infrastructure right. to attract business to, back to the island, to improve the tax base and to you know, get jobs, once in a lifetime opportunity. So don't screw it up, right? You have to really be thoughtful about how you do that. And by the way, mm. because the federal government doesn't, it will take back any money that is misspent or come back and, and, and claw back money that is misspent, uh, be really careful about how you spend it, right? Be really careful about how you do that. Uh, but they're going to need a lot of help uh, with infrastructure. But but they have again, they have a tremendous opportunity down there to remake that island into something that's that's uh, that's never been seen before. Yeah, it's really incredible to think about uh, the in entire infrastructure being lifted up. I mean that that really does change everything in terms of you know I'm a, a small business owner myself and think I'm oh, okay if like great infrastructure de depends where we put our business. Right. Yeah. And if we want to do business in a place, if we don't have connectivity or if, we, if, we're, if we're worried about that, or if there's even hazards associated with, you know, I'm looking at this thing that's 50 years out of date and sparking every, you know, every few minutes, I'm like, okay, like hard yeah. pass. Right. So you're not, you're not going to go there. Right. No, if you don't have power, right. You don't have uh, telecom, internet, uh, you don't have water, you don't have housing for employees mm. or families that want to move down there. It, it, it won't work. So they have, they have all that ahead of them and they have a plan to do it and it'll take them, you know, it'll probably take them 20 years to, 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 you know, get to the end of it. Maybe. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a, it's uphill battle, but again, it's one with like the greatest opportunity uh, in a lifetime. It's a gift. It's a gift. Even though you had a disaster and people lost their lives, you know, the benefit of all that is really a, a, a gift like uh, we ha I've never seen before. Yeah. That's uh, 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 I, I guess that's the win for emergency manager. So uh, I have two questions based off of that. Yeah. So on the one side, we are looking at um, like this, this idea of you know, I'm propping people up financially. And sometimes I call it like FEMA, the IRS of disasters. And the way I, the, the reason why I call it the IRS of disasters is even if I get a tax return from the IRS, I'm still not a huge fan of the IRS. Right. And so like, what, what can you do like to, to change that persona of FEMA? So that's, I guess that's the first question. How do we get away from being the IRS of disasters? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the law says that uh, we have the Stafford Act and our job is to uh, do recovery. And, and, and in that comes money, right? To do all those things, public assistance and individual assistance and, and grants and mitigation, right? All those things are part of what the law says we have to do. Uh, you know, I, I think we have to be um, probably, uh, first of all, we have to make greater investment in, in pre-disaster uh, investments like mitigation and BRIC, yeah. right? Uh, the Congress passed the DRRA, uh, Disaster Recovery Reform Act, uh, end of 2018, that allowed us to set aside 6% of all disasters um, and all that 6%, that's how BRIC is funded. Uh, that 6% mm -hmm. goes into pre-disaster mitigation and, uh, and making the country more resilient. And, and part of the, our challenges and things that we haven't done well in, and Congress uh, gives us grief on it for the right reason, is that we, we, we um, uh, it's hard to show return on investment for those things, right? And yeah. in some cases, we, we're too lax with who we give money to, right? We say, go do it. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying lax that we don't, we're not accounting for the money, but, you know, is it really a project that has a great a, a return on investment that closes a gap 
and makes the infrastructure more resilient, right? Did, did you invest in the right thing? Uh, not just because you had this money you had, to, you had to spend, but you had thought and, and meaning behind it and a plan to make your community more resilient by, again, brick and infrastructure, investing in those kind of things. So we, as a nation, we have to do much more of that up front, because the, the, the truth of it is, uh, no matter the cost of the disaster, right? Taxpayers will fund that, right? It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. We, you know, look at COVID. How much money? It's just not the money that FEMA has spent. But look at the rest of the, you know, the supplementals and other agencies that have spent in COVID. So we'll pay any amount to to try to get back to normal. We have to change the culture, right? So. Yeah. Let's invest ahead of time, uh, but that's that's you know it's it sounds nice and it's and um, it's but it's hard to do, uh, especially when you have you know a governor that has uh, a certain amount of money and in a, in a uh, appropriated money and there's competing priorities about hey do we really want to spend money on something that may or may not happen like you know disaster mitigation wise yep. we really need we really need an honest conversation about that. Uh, in in the nation, and I'll just say I just tell you one story, and this is what I think really uh, kind of woke me up. I uh, spoke at the IEM conference uh, in Savannah, uh, November two thousand nineteen, I think it was pre COVID, and uh, I'm giving the keynote speech to the fifteen hundred emergency managers in the convention center, and uh, I, ha I had this little shtick that I did that I do on the road, and one of it was about mitigation. So I, I, I asked a simple question of the 1,500 emergency managers from across the country, right? A good representation of all those emergency managers. Who in the room are mitigators, right? Because I'm mm -hmm. talking about mitigation in my presentation. And, and I'm expecting like 1,500 hands to go up and say, yeah, we're yeah. all mitigators. So 12, 12 people raised their hand. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not exaggerating that. 12 people raised their hand. You know, they're all, they're all sitting together. Somehow they found the 12 mitigators found each other. And, they're, and the, you know, <laughs> 1400 and whatever, right? They, they don't raise their hand. And so that made me nervous that, yeah. that well, there's no one doing mitigation in the country. But if I had asked the question, who in the room are, are responders? How many hands would have gone up, John? 1500. All of, all of yeah. them, all of them would have gone up. <laughs> so again, we have, to, we have to kind of change, you know, the, the money is not in response. As a nation, we are awesome at response because we do it every day. We're good at it, right? And, and yeah. we like it. Yeah. Uh, but what we're not good at is mitigation and recovery because it's long, it's complicated. You don't get immediate satisfaction from it. But we have to change the culture. You know, I, I would hope to go back to IEM and ask the same question, who are mitigators and get 1,500 people to raise their hand. That would be a win. But we have a ways to go on that. But it's a culture change that we have to, we have to uh, educate our emergency managers on. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is I mean, you led right into the second question. I'm a data guy. I went, I did operations and planning before, and then I got, I, I went, I beelined in a completely different direction when I got uh, hired as the GIUL for FEMA and all those GIS guys might like cringe when they hear that. But, uh, you know, I was able to bring in this idea of a, a GIS person who's able to speak ops and vice versa. And, uh, that was really the genius of my, uh, my boss, Rodney Melsick. But, um, through learning that, my thought process is, I'm not talking about minority report, right? I'm not talking about like predicting. I'm talking about, we have enough data out there to say like, hey, we know what your risk is. Like, we can figure it out. Um, you're with uh, a group called, I believe, Lyro? Lyro, yep. pronouncing that right? Yeah, Lyro. Okay, so, and they do construction, right? So like, if we have- Construction management. Okay, there you go, construction management. If we have all this data to say, hey, we know exactly what your gaps are, why do we still have a culture, not just in emergency management, but in politics to say, well, we'll, we'll wait for it to happen. Like, you know, it's yeah. going to happen. You can see it. you're in a floodplain, right? Yeah. Yep. So how, how do we switch that? Yeah, it's, it's, and it's a great insight because it, it's one of the, it's one of the lessons learned out of COVID-19. So uh, I, I realize, and so j just, you know, any disaster, the amount of information coming at you, right, especially as a leader uh, that you have to, you know, and your, and your team is helping you sift through it all to kind of pull out the nuggets where you can make good decisions, right? Decision support material, and hopefully make a decision before it happens, or at least impact how it happens, uh, or prevent it from happening to some degree. Uh, so what I realized at FEMA is, uh, and, and this is probably no different than anywhere else, but I'm, I'm just speaking as the former administrator. Uh, 
we at FEMA collect a ton of information, collect, right? So you name it, we have a partner that probably shares it with us and we collect it and we, we try to display it in, you know, with GIS and we try to share it. Uh, but one of the things that we don't have, and this is one of the things that uh, is part of the after ration at FEMA is that uh, what we really, and so this is, you know, I, you know, being in the military, so I understand this part. Uh, and, and, and during COVID, I had a lot of help from DOD, right? A lot of uh, military planners came over to help with the immense amount of work that, that needed to happen. Uh, but one of the things that the military does is they collect a lot of information, right? Uh, and they try to make sense of it all, uh, even before the battle, right? Collect it all to, to understand the environment uh, and maybe even understand some decisions that you're going to have to make before you have to make them. Uh, but what we don't have in emergency management, what we don't have in FEMA, and I, and I, and I hope it's going to change, is to have uh, intel analysis like the military, like a group of, a big group, uh, a big room of really smart intel, and part of, my, part of my language, intel geeks that are just pouring through information and trying to make sense of it all every day. Not, be, not because yeah. the, the hurricane is five days up, but every day of the year. They're pouring through information and they're trying to make products and they're trying to uh, make uh, decision support material for you and the president, right? Uh, so we have to do a lot better at, at the intel analysis of all the data we collect. Uh, yeah. We don't do it that well. We're not really built for it. The military does it all the time. We need to adopt that model. And uh, I hope the boys in, uh, in ORR are listening, uh, that it, they're still working on that project to, to make that happen. Okay. So my side of that, like just real talk, just cause I was involved in that is, uh, as a guy who felt like his job in FEMA was a hundred percent response and doing GIS, uh, I felt like my job was intelligence. Like if I wasn't providing situational awareness to the incident commander of like X, Y, and Z can happen. There's a really famous story and I actually cannot go into too much detail because of the, the sensitivity of the topic. But there was, a, there was a potential incident in Hurricane Harvey that uh, we had figured out through GIS. In fact, myself and the planning support unit lead, Patrick McGinn, big shout out to him. Um, and we figured out something could happen. We sent it over to the incident commander. He said, how do you know about this? You don't have uh, clearance. I'm like, well, we just saw it on a map and we think that something X can happen. They took care of the situation and nobody was hurt. And... Feeding that up to headquarters, here's my big gripe, and this is why maybe GIS at headquarters like gets on me a bit. You're like, oh, that's not within our 22 standard maps. You're like, you freaking moron. Like, that's not the job. Like, 22 standard maps is great for nice to know, but like, I, I agree 100%, and I get really passionate about this. At Doberman, because I bring up that GIS background, I don't want to do a big pitch here, but... For every client we have, we give them a hazard vulnerability assessment. We say, hey, just looking at all the data, this is, this is your problems. And you should be aware of that. And this is like the, the threat analysis. And I agree with you. I think there needs to be an arm that includes real GIS. And, and the, the people at FEMA have that capability, but they don't use it. The, you, real GIS with real experienced responders talking every single day and saying, okay, like, oh, you know, I see a problem on a map. How, how much of a real problem is that? And start to do some analysis based off of that. And um, yeah, my number you know, one, yeah. Oh my gosh. I could talk about that forever, please. Yeah. Yeah. Talk. So, so I, I, this is one of my pet peeves. You know, I, so I used to tell the team, listen, you know, in a, if I, if I could design today uh, what, what I want, you know, I want to know um, like every day. And we'll, so we'll just put like hurricane prone, uh, you know, city or town or state you know, Gulf Coast, you know, I want to know uh, today, every day, uh, how many cars are on each road, like the, the, the traffic right. counts, like in real time. I want to know how much gas is in the ground by grade. And I want to know where that is on a map. I want to know how much money is are in ATM machines, which ones don't, which uh, are closed. I want to know how much food is on the shelf. I want to know all these things, right? And I want you to like, and, and I want to know all the other things that I'm not talking about. So infrastructure, what's a below ground, above ground, you know, uh, electrons. I want to know, know it all. And I want somebody to tell me what's, what I should be doing, what, what's important about all this and where they intersect, where they don't intersect. Or, uh, and again, try to be predictive about some of these things, right? Yeah. We, we need to get to be that smart 
and, and there are guys and gals out there that are that smart. We just need to adopt uh, some of that, uh, some of those, um, uh, you know, practices at FEMA that, and, and I'll, you know, the military has. We just need to adopt some of those practices when it comes to how we look at information, how we analyze it, and how we use it to make really good decisions. Not because we're behind the the, the power curve, uh, but because we, we're looking out way out ahead. And that's the other thing that that mm -hmm. I think as a as a uh, you know, emergency management um, profession. We don't look far enough out. You know, we all, we're yeah. always looking at the, you know, what's happening in front of us the, the 24 hours. And, you know, one of the things I made uh, the guys and gals do in operations is like, listen, we're doing this COVID thing every 24 hours, every 48 hours, right? We know what's going on there. Hey, I want to know, like, what's going to happen in two weeks or four weeks or six weeks. I need, so I need a team out there, future ops, right? Future mm -hmm. ops looking way ahead so they can guide me to that. What happens is, we put our blinders on, we get into the 24, 48, 96 hour cycle. And then we turn, then we put our head up and we bump into the wall because we weren't watching far enough out. So these are, these are all the things I think lessons learned from, from COVID really yeah. highlighted all, but as a profession, we really need to change that. And I, and I, and I'll, and I'll tell you, it all goes back to education, right? So we have to educate, yep. you know, the, the brand new emergency managers in college and universities uh, or on the job through FEMA University to go to, to be better professionals. Uh, talk about full circle mic drop moment. And I, I think that's kind of a good place to wrap it up. Uh, you're, you're, you, you talked about so many things. I got I to gotta walk back my tape a little bit. Uh, GIS at FEMA, you guys are incredible. You guys yeah, they're and coming, gals, they're, they're gonna hunt you down. I think, John. You better <laughs> I think they will. Them. You know, you know how GIS people are. They're super passionate. So, I yeah, love, but, I love no, them they, all. I love them all. Yeah, me too. So, my my thing is, they have they have the mental and they have the intellectual capa capability to do more. And I would just hope that they do more. And I think there's yeah, a yeah, lot of people and, who want to do that, right? I mean, I know. I, I think so, it's like we have to make them. We have to like actually prioritize all that at the, at the, at the headquarters level, make it a priority to do it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the leadership thing. Yeah. And, and the other thing is like, they have to see that there's like the, the value added, right? Like why to do this? Oh, because you're, you, what you, what you're talking about right now is this idea of data driven decision-making or, or d data to be able to support real decision-making. I'm so tired of like, getting out there and somebody who doesn't really understand data and like they're afraid of it. And so they're like, Oh, I'm just going to make a call. Like, no, I can, I can help you make better calls. I can make you help do it, do it faster. And I think what you're saying is hundred percent on point. Yeah. Um, better education. I agree that schools and universities uh, from a guy who has two degrees in emergency management, who loves my degrees, but I, I do think that the field can step up there and uh, you know, the, and, you and, full circle, and, so. and so, you know, again, another one of my pet peeves, uh, you know, how do, I used to say, how do people, how do people find FEMA, right? Well, mm -hmm. they find us because, the, and, and you can say this for any level of emergency management, they find us because we have the greatest mission in government, helping people before, during, and after disasters. That applies from the local to the federal, right? They yeah. find us because they have, they, they want that as, you know, uh, you know as, a, as a, it's in their DNA. So they want to go do that. So they find us, good people find us. But what we don't mm -hmm. do enough, we don't go to college and universities and go recruit. Right. We should be. And this goes for everyone. You should don't don't wait for someone to knock on your door. That's really talented because yeah. that really talented guy or girl, he just got recruited by Google or you know, <laughs> some some contractor that snapped them up. We have, again, as a profession and as FEMA, we have to go out to the college and universities and actually go recruit and compete with all the other companies in the United States that's looking for great talent. Uh, just letting it happen on its own. It's, it's a it's a it's a. Uh, a failure point. Yeah, I agree. Well, there's, that's a, oh my gosh, we could talk about that for a whole nother hour, which we'll probably yeah. bring you back on to just to talk about sure, the educational piece. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you understand all my pet peeves. <laughs> if there, if there, we're going to give, I always ask the same question at the end to everybody. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't really think they're pet peeves. I think what you're saying right now, you're calling them pet peeves, but really it's just, Hey, getting people to, to, to change that culture mindset. So, okay. But if you're going to talk to the future emergency manager, if you're going to all those lessons you just talked about, if you're going to change one thing about emergency management, we kind of hit on it, but if you're going to change one thing, what would it be today? Um, 
so just to narrow it down, so as just as a profession or as a leadership position or as a profession, as the as the profession of emergency management, how would you change it so it's more impactful in the future? Um, so I, I think we need to elevate emergency managers' role in the country, right? And and I think I think we've seen this in COVID, where you know uh, all of a sudden it's emergency managers everywhere from from the plains of Nebraska. All the way to you know the the, the downtown uh, New York doing hard hard jobs that no one wants to do and making the magic magic happen. I think for the most part, people think of emergency managers as oh we just need those guys when the when the bad thing happens. It's always an afterthought. Uh, but we should we I think and I think we've matured a lot in this past uh, year and a half uh, two years uh, as a profession. But we just need to to uh, I think if you could bring emergency managers uh, to the to the level. Uh, higher levels, uh, you know, police, fire, EMS, like all are playing on the same uh, field. I think it's it's better for the profession. Uh, and, and, and you know, first of all, emergency management is a new is is you know the history of it uh, is is a relatively immature profession, right? It's it, it's only been on the books for you know in a, in a formal way for you know maybe 50 years, uh, and compare that to police officers and fire departments and everything else, right? So we have a ways to go to mature the profession. Uh, but I think, uh, again, the level and importance of emergency managers in your local town, your state, uh, the federal government, your tribe, your territory is critically important uh, to the safety uh, of your citizens, right? It's, it's critical. Uh, and if you're an emergency manager, uh, you, need to be, you need to be banging on the door of your elected leaders to make sure they understand that, right? Not, not, mm. not uh, you know, imminent before the disaster, uh, but you know, every day it's it's a hard it's a hard message to do, but you, you have to do it uh, because when it all unravels, uh, they're calling one person, and that's the person with emergency in their title. Pete, uh, that's great advice. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Great way to end it out. Elevate, and I think that's the the the, the message for today. Elevate, and obviously you've done that through your own, your own career, obviously, but you've done that for the agency for Federal Emergency Management Agency, as well as DHS, and, and you're moving on to, to greater things down. So we'd love to have you back on the show. But sure. thanks again for, for providing advice to us today. Thanks, John. Anytime. It's a pleasure to be with uh, you and all your uh, all your listeners. Yeah, the, the 20,000 or so people that are going to be listening to the show, um, you know, potentially it's going to be uh, pretty exciting to, to hear their feedback. And if you are one of our listeners, if you like this show, which you should have great advice on the show today, you need to give us that five-star rating and subscribe. We obviously always that pitch, but tune in every week. We do great episodes. Pete, we're going to have him back on the show, hopefully, because he gave great advice there. And we can talk about education. If you have questions for Pete, you can do it a couple different ways. We always have people sending us emails at info at dobermanemg.com. We're grateful for that. However, what we'd love to see is on our social media channels, Put it out there publicly, and, and that will be the fastest way Pete will be able to see it, and you can respond to that way. But again, uh, tune in every week. Pete, thanks again for coming to the show, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Sean.